Hey everybody, uh, I'm Nadav, I'm a research engineer at uh, Yahoo Research, which uh, lately acquired by Verizon, so now we are part of uh, Verizon Media Group. Today I'll talk about the uh, work I've done with uh, Ron Wolf, temporal clustering, and the uh, algorithm we developed uh, named the uh, Fun K-Means. So let's start with the motivation. Uh, the ability to cluster uh, data into groups that contain similar objects uh, is very, crit very critical for a lot of applications in a lot of fields. And in many cases, uh, the data is non not uh, non-stationary. It might have trends, uh, it might contain uh, seasonality, uh, temporal uh, data, for example, uh, amount of purchase uh, over uh, weekends. And um, if we look, ignore the, these temporal uh, features uh, of the data in, uh, in the clustering, we might lose uh, some insights. For example, so let, let's look on the, on the graph on the top. Uh, we, we don't know anything about the time each data origin. Uh, we might get clusters like the chart below. But if I'll show you how this uh, data originated uh, in each timestamp, we can clearly see that we had the three sources of data that uh, move uh, smoothly over the time. So ignoring this, uh, the data is not good enough. But uh, treat the, the time uh, dimension as, as regular uh, dimension will not help either. If we'll just uh, change the n dimension data to n plus one the, the dimension and the apply cluster algorithm, we might get the cluster that we see below. And uh, if you look carefully, you can see that the cluster, the purple cluster, contains uh, uh, objects originated only on the F period. Um, and this didn't, don't what we, this is not the desired uh, result. What we really want is a clusters that able to uh, describe the non-stationarity behavior, behavior of the data. We want it to be cons consistent, consist consistent over, over all the period and smoothly changed. And also, if you look carefully on data, we can say we, in uh, some insurance that where the clusters are going to be in the next timestamp. So if you have the ability to predict where it's going to be, it will be great too. So as our uh, algorithm name suggests, fun k-means, we are uh, variants of k-means. How many people are, uh, how many people are uh, familiar with k-means? Yeah, uh, many hands. So uh, the reason uh, k-means is so popular is because of simplicity. One of the reasons, at least. Uh, given uh, data objects and uh, a number k that represent how much cluster, cluster do we want uh, to produce, we first uh, initiate, initiate uh, centroids. Each centroid represents cluster, the center of the cluster. We then uh, assign each uh, object to one of the cluster. We, so we're, doing, we're doing it by, uh, by choosing the one with the shortest distance between each object to, it, uh, to the centroid. And the next step is to uh, uh, update the, the centroid to be in the center of the data it represents. For example, we take all the yellow, yellow uh, points, uh, average them, and find the new position of the centroid. By doing that, we actually minimize the some square uh, distance between the uh, centroid and its objects. And uh, these two steps, the these two, st two steps, the update and the assignment, uh, we repeat it uh, until we converge. Uh, when I say converge, I mean that no uh, object wants to go to another cluster. And uh, in this example, we it's. Uh, it's occur after two iterations. So the art of fun k means the main idea is replace, we take the centroids, 
that uh, in came is coming from the same uh, space domain, and we replace it with a function from the time domain to to the space. In that way, we get uh, consistently consistent uh, centroids. They are smoothly changed over the time. Um, of course, you can no longer uh, as, um, center the, the centroids by averaging, so we use uh, some fitting. And the nice feature of uh, our algorithm is that uh, the function and the fitting method are pluggable and uh, can be dictated by, by the user. Uh, it can, uh, you can put their constraints, you can uh, put, them, put their, uh, their, your assumptions. Um, let's see some formal definitions of what I just described. Uh, on the upper uh, side, you can see the formal definition of k-means. In the lower side, it's the fun k-means. So in k-means, we get data from, uh, uh, we get m uh, objects from uh, n dimension space, and uh, the center is represented by uh, k uh, objects from the same domain. In fun k-means, we have a tuple, each, each object uh, contains all, contain, it's a tuple of uh, time and the uh, end space domain point. And the centroids are now function from uh, time t to this domain. Uh, the assignment step, uh, to assign uh, to, sem to object i uh, one of the cluster, in k-means, we, we choose the, the minimum, the centroid, that, we choose the centroid j that minimizes the distance between the object to its uh, centroid. In fun k-means, it's very similar, but instead of uh, measure the, the, the distance to the centroid itself, we, we first uh, put the timestamp of the data of the object and then measure the distance. And the, the update step, where, where we choose uh, where it, where, what is the next uh, place of the centroid, instead of averaging all the samples of cluster J in order to find its position, we now uh, take the set of uh, samples that belong to, to centroid J and fit a new function. So next I'll show you a synthetic example. The left side of the screen is, is the k-means uh, steps that we saw before. Uh, we, uh, we, we saw before. It's just to compare the stages, but uh, you can ignore it. So we get uh, data that contains two, the, two dimension, x and y, and uh, also have timestamp. Uh, the lower part is uh, time zero, the upper part is, uh, is uh, time uh, four, five. And uh, we can clearly see that the, we have uh, three uh, clusters that's moving over time. We choose to represent the function with uh, polynomes, and we use polyfit, which is an algorithm to find the polynomial coefficients uh, in order to, to find the centroids. So the first uh, stage, we initialize centroids. In that case, oh, I forgot to mention, I'm showing you just one centroid. We have three there, but uh, in order to make it more clear, I'm showing just one. So uh, we initialize a centroid. In that case, it's a constant centroid. You can see that it has the same, uh, same value over the time, over all the time. Then we assign each object uh, one of the clusters. In that case, we assign all the yellow points to the centroid. And the next step, in the update step, instead of averaging the data, we apply polyfit to all the yellow yellow uh, objects, in order to find the, the best polynomial that describes this data. And uh, again, we, we return about you know, two, st two steps until we converge. And we can see that uh, after five iterations, we converge to the real synthetic source of the data. It's a uh, to the two other centroids too, believe me. Um, So uh, some challenges we tackle during the walk. So initializ initial initialization is super important in uh, k-means algorithms because uh, you, con you, you don't have guarantee that you will converge to the uh, global optimum. Um, when I, 
from when I say global optimum, I'm uh, saying I'm saying I'm referred to the sum of squares of all the objects and the you know, against the centroids. So poor initialization may cause to poor uh, convergence. And there is a very popular initialization algorithm for k-means, k-means plus plus, which uh, implemented in most of the common libraries like uh, sklearn which uh, provides uh, several uh, nice bounds uh, against the optimum. Uh, but uh, it can't translate naively to, to the fun function domain. Uh, we implemented several heuristics. Uh, one of them is the one below that I show, uh, presented before. We, we choose uh, end point, k points uh, with k means plus plus. And, um, and provide constant values. Um, an another example is uh, sampling several points and fit the uh, in initial centroid. Both worked well. Convergence. So I didn't mention it explicitly when I uh, talked about uh, k-means, but uh, in k-means, in each iteration, you have a guarantee that the the total uh, sum of squares will, uh, is going down. It's monot monot monotonically decreasing. When we are fitting a function, we are no longer have this guarantee. So we had to, it, uh, to change several points in the algorithm in order to, to guarantee the monot monotonically decreasing uh, characteristic. Overfitting, it somehow relates to the initialization but uh, again, when we're talking about functions, the, we have uh, more uh, free parameters and we might stack in a place where we can't converge to, to a good place. In this example, I took the same example as I presented before and uh, now I uh, allow a polynom from a fifth order. And as you can see, it's conv it, uh, it couldn't converge to, to the real origins. Um, the way we handle it was the, in the function level. For, example, for a poly, polyfit example, we, we force a maximum dimension. It can be a regularized, a regularized, a regularization object for linear regression. For a um, periodic uh, function where we described our data with uh, spectrum of frequencies, we can uh, take only the top n uh, frequencies if you look on their amplitude, and so on. Oh, so two data sets that we worked on and some qualitative results. The first one is the BACO. It's a free data set that we took from Kaggle. Uh, it contains uh, several features that represent the smoking behavior in the states in, uh, in the United States over the years. And in this chart I'm, I'm showing, I I'm present uh, the never smoke frequency in each, uh, in each uh, point of the time in the states. And uh, you can see by eye that there are two major clusters. One that uh, contains a lower, f low, a lower frequency of never uh, smokers, and one that is more sparse on the up uh, side. If we look at Cayman's results, the cluster the central is doesn't, doesn't if, if we apply a k means to the data, we get results that doesn't reflect well the, the source. For example, let's look on the upper uh, class centroid. For the early years, it's above the, all its samples. Yes? For uh, the last years, it's uh, almost below. And you, it also took several points that uh, belong to the lower clusters. However, if you look on the fun k-means with the polyfit, it's representing much better way the, the cluster that's, uh, that it's color, uh, that, that, that assigned to it. And we also can uh, get some insights. For example, let's look on the lower cluster. We can see that there is a trend in the to, to inc that the never smokers increase in the last years. And we can predict what will be well, what will be happening in the next year, for example. Another uh, interesting data set was the weather data set. 
Uh, it's also public data. It's uh, I took it from uh, NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration of USA. Uh, it's a daily met, uh, meteorologi meteorologi meteorological metrics uh, from several uh, stations over US. It contains features as ma such uh, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, uh, humidity, precipitation, and so on. Um, in this plot, you can see data taken over uh, three, three years. Uh, the x-axis is the time. The y-axis is the max temperature in, uh, in each day on several stations. Um, and the ply uh, came in from this data will provide us uh, three clusters, but it doesn't describe the seasonality of the data. For example, theoretically, you can get the, the warmest pl place on the, on the winter uh, could get the same uh, centrade as the coldest place on the summer. Uh, looking on, the, on what uh, fun came in achieved with the DFT algorithm, uh, we can see that it's described in a much better way the seasonality of the data. So I, sh I uh, presented you two, two easy examples of uh, funky means, but we, we, can know, we can't always uh, evaluate it uh, by eye or qualitative, and we want to measure how good are we. Do we really catch a temporal behavior? So if you just compare the energy of the fitted data, we'll almost, we'll, we'll almost always win the k-means. That's because we have another parameters to, to describe the clusters. Uh, and this, this is not enough. So we evaluate uh, this experiment. We took uh, our data. We divided it to two periods, training period and the test period. In this example, we took uh, the weather data set and the, the two first years are the, are the training period and, the, and the, sec the test period is the last year. We apply, we learn the model on the training period and compare the, compare the energy between uh, k-means and fun k-means on the test period. If we really catch a uh, temporal behavior, we expect it to provide uh, b lower uh, energy. So what I described right now, we're doing it on sliding window over a long period, and then we can get significance of how, how much good we are against the uh, k-means. In the right chart, you can see several windows where the blue dots represent the energy of uh, fun k-means and the uh, Orange dots represent the energy of uh, k-means, and like you can see, we 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 almost always get between 60 to 70 percent lower energy against k-means. So to summarize, uh, we discussed about the data data set that contains uh, temporal behavior. We understood why I uh, ignored this. Uh, Temporal uh, behavior is, is will can cause us to to wrong insights from cluster, clustering perspective. We also saw that uh, treating the time dimension as another dimension is not enough, and uh, I presented the algorithm that we developed that uh, was able to to describe this data well in several cases. Uh, that's all. Thank you.